Awesome. All right, everybody. My name is Todd Tarazis, and I'm the founder and executive director of the AILA community. We're a nonprofit organization that's been around for over six years, convening people like yourselves to talk about how AI impacts our, our personal and professional lives. Obviously, in the last six months, we've been seeing a crazy big uh, influx of people using these text-to-image or text-to-text -text type generators. Who here in the audience has ever used ChatGPT? Raise your hands. All right, who here has ever used Midjourney or Dolly? All right, we got a few takers. Well, today, if you got the app, the web app from uh, Vice City Ventures earlier today when you walked in, you'll be able to actually use text to image inside that app, and then we can all vote on it later today. So after this panel discussion, we'll be doing a live prompting competition. There's no real prize except going home knowing that you were number one. Uh, today's been a great day because we're going to be convening about how AI is impacting media entertainment, really just art in general. And that means motion picture, that means art, uh, music, digital art, and experiential art. And so we have a fantastic lineup of speakers here today, but before that, I really have to give a hand uh, to Brian at Expert Dojo. Right now, we are in Expert Dojo's <laughs> lair. Thank, thank you, thank you, Todd. So Todd said, hey, uh, I'm just gonna bring a couple of my friends around, is it okay? I'm like, yeah, okay, maybe. Um, I want to say a little something about AI generative art um, because I arrived here like 10 years ago. I met some great friends. Uh, this man here was one of my first friends. Todd over here as well. Formed great communities. And at the time, I fell in love with creativity in Santa Monica, LA, Southern California. There's nowhere like this anywhere. And Irish people don't lie, okay? We drink and we don't lie. This is the greatest place for creativity on the planet full stop. And at that time, I wanted to do something about the creativity that was here. So from about four or five years ago, when we started to build this place up, we've invested in around 250 companies um, at the period. This year, we'll invest in another 200 companies. So why do we, Expert Dojo, invest in so many companies so early? Because we love the creativity, and I get a buzz from it. And I got to say, when I was walking through here tonight, and I'm watching this beautiful, AI generative art, like I'm seeing the future of how art is and I feel the same as I did when I saw the startups. So first of all, I will say if anybody's looking for investments, just be a good startup, okay? But if you're looking for investment, you can email me, brian at expertdojo.com. Uh, second, and to Todd and to Lawrence and Vice Ventures, I want to give these guys a big round of applause because this is no average event, okay? Thank you, guys. Thank you, Brian. Thank you so much, Brian. Seriously, having a great venue partner like Expert Dojo makes these things really happen. And next but not least is, uh, where is Zen? Sorry, you're right in front of me. I wanted you to quickly say something about your, um, uh, your displays you're showing. Hey, how's it going, guys? My name is Zen. Um, uh, two years ago, uh, we saw a space uh, to be an incentive into distributing digital art into the real world. Uh, so I made this thing, you know, uh, this repository open source on GitHub, and I reached out to uh, Alibaba's like manufacturers, and I said, hey, you guys should use this. Now, if you type in on GitHub, I mean, uh, uh, on Alibaba NFT, that's our open source project we made available, and we made it affordable for everyone in the world to display their NFTs into the blockchain, or, or in, in, in the real world. So this is one of our uh, newest pieces that we've created. Uh, this is like a square, like uh, high-end, like 5G module that has like a four gigabyte like download speed. So um, part of Verizon's 5G accelerator program, we're prototyping and we're distributing our technology in education systems, uh, college stadiums, clinics, and yeah, we just want to push the whole space forward and incentivize. And if you guys have any questions in putting your art or integrating, please let me know. All right, that's it. Thank you so much, Dan. Woo! And I forgot to mention, so while you walked into the space today, you probably noticed all the art on the different displays. And that was all generously also uh, donated by a a EZAD, Lawrence's company here, who will be your amazing moderator in a second. But uh, before that, I also wanted to say thank you to a few different sponsors. Seth at uh, AI Creative Community. AI Creative Community is focusing on utilizing the power of generative artificial intelligence to improve the world. Deep Dream Generator. Uh, experience the power of AI-generated images and revolutionize your design process with Deep Dream Generator. And then Night, Ca Night Cafe, creating amazing artworks using the power of artificial intelligence. And so we had tonight, we had a ridiculous record. I think we had about 30 artists submit, submit, uh, submit uh, to be included in this showcase. And unfortunately, 
because there was just so much demand and then also really just not enough room to showcase everything. Uh, we couldn't accept everyone, of course, but we do have 16 artists being showcased here today. So hopefully you'll be able to meet some of the artists. Most of them were actually from LA. We're super grateful. We got one from Milan and one from Brazil that's super grateful to be here. So we got international representation here on the showcase. Um, and we're just really, really, really proud about the amount of uh, quality of content that came through here, where it was an AI-assisted art creation. And we'll learn more about the artwork that uh, our panelists have worked on as well. And um, really, without further ado, I would love to give it over to Lawrence to introduce our panel and uh, get into everything. So thank you all. How's everybody doing tonight? How's everybody doing tonight? That's the spirit. As Todd said, my name is Lawrence Mansoor, founder of both Easy Ad and Vice City Ventures. We are so thrilled to have this amazing panel today of talented and really the future of AI is on this panel right now. I'm so enthusiastic about tonight. And so as everybody knows, AI has changed the world so fast. I like to think of myself as one of the OGs back in 2018 sitting on TensorFlow. Who knows about TensorFlow here? OG TensorFlow people, thank you. Developing those models and now in, in the end of 2022, I mean, I was just blown away by how fast AI is being able to train and progress and evolve and create. It's just been in extremely interesting to see. So today, I want to introduce our panel. Let's start off with the ladies. Do you want to start? Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Taryn Southern. Uh, back in 2017, 2018, I composed an album with a variety of AI software programs. That was really my first foray. I also did some generative art um, as part of a Google art and residency. Um, and so got to play with sort of the early stages of mixing and mingling these technologies. And like you, I'm blown away with where they're at now. Hey, everyone. So my name is Aya. I'm a data scientist, a CEO, and a digital AI artist. I've been in the AI space for over, a, well, I say in the computational space for over a decade and in the data science space for five years. And I fell into AI art and digital art when I received a Stanford grant in 2021 to explore the intersection of generative art, um, well, actually, generative modeling, natural language processing, and Afrofuturism. And I'll tell you guys more about that soon. We can't wait to hear it. And on this side, Paul? Hi, I'm Paul Trillo. I'm a filmmaker, uh, I guess, also video artist, content creator, um, but come from a sort of experimental filmmaking background, but I've done narrative films, music videos, uh, commercials, and a lot of my work is always kind of exploring new techniques, uh, curious about the future, and trying to understand how um, we can use technology to deliver visuals that we haven't seen before, so how filmmaking can be advanced and how creative concepts can come out of new technology. So naturally, I kind of gravitated towards um, AI image making, uh, specifically how it relates to live action video and not just fully animated. Um, and yeah, have been kind of pursuing that and hopefully We'll, uh, we'll get into it later, but um, just about how I think the visual effects industry will be changed by AI. Absolutely. Last but not least, Don. Hello. My name is Don Allen Stevenson III. I'm an XR creator, just doing a lot of AR and VR stuff. Uh, previously at DreamWorks, I used to teach all of our software for our movies, uh, then resigned, and then kind of went freelance. Now I'm doing a lot of like AI education and uh, you know sharing knowledge and inspiration around humans and technology having a better future tomorrow versus a black mirror future tomorrow. Awesome. And so we are going to start with our first question. What was everyone's first AI project that you were really proud of? I already shared mine. Yeah, we did. I feel like you I've spoiler already alert. So, I mean, I don't know if I was really proud of it. You know, you make something and you an anticipate that, that it's not going to be as good as it could be because you're working with new technology and you just Absolutely. assume that you trip and fail. But I, that al the album, it was called I Am AI. Um, nice. And it was a really in interesting collaboration with four different technologies. Very nice. And what did you 
exactly. Tell us about the album. What, what was your goal of it? Yeah, I wanted to compose pop songs um, using artificial intelligence as the sole compositional tool. But I pulled in, depending on the technology that I worked with, I was able to collaborate with other musical styles. So I did a pop song in collaboration with 1800s romantic style period p piano pieces. Um, and uh, so that was a really fun experiment, was how can I infuse different musical styles into pop music to create something that's novel and different um, than maybe what we're used to hearing on the radio. Wow, that's amazing to hear. Just integrating, like, today is about generative AI, but also seeing the elements of music that AI can compose is just groundbreaking. Absolutely. And, and, and back then, I mean, there was some of the tools were pretty rudimentary. Google InSynth was a tool that allowed you to create new sounds. Uh, I, I don't know if it was a stable diffusion model, but it might have been. I think it was. Um, and, diffusion? And so I, I actually created, like, a cat harp. Um, with my cat's meow and with a harp, and it ended up in the song. So wow. I don't know. We got to hear that. Where can we hear that at? It's not very It's not live. You got to publish. <laughs> Cat and AI and pop. Look at that. I, uh, on to you. Uh, so for those who heard this already, bear with me. Um, so my first project was through my Stanford grant where I was looking at the intersection of Afrofuturism, generative modeling, and natural language processing. And I wanted to use those tools to really see can we co-create with AI to create different experiences, like very strong imagery, and also can we use it to tell very strong authentic stories. And that's where the Afrofuturism comes in, because really I wanted more Black Panther. And so I wanted to see, can I do this with AI? And so, um, and at that same time, I did this grant actually while I was like still a data scientist as I am now. And some of the, the inspiration for using natural language processing came from my day job. So in my day job at that time, I used natural language processing um, in a way as when you call customer service and the like virtual assistant says, um, hey, like, I can understand regular speech to text. And so really providing that technology behind the, the scenes is what I was working on with my team. And so I wanted to use that same process of being able to you know, gather insights from text with AI in a very like, um, structured way to really have a pipeline to the actual output. And they use nationalized processing on the book Binti. And Binti is a Afrofuturism um, sci-fi book that talks about, uh, well, star, stars a woman, or a young girl, excuse me, from Namibia, and she goes on a trip to um, a very, very, like the Harvards of Harvards in space university, and she actually escaped, like her family didn't want her to go, and so I wanted to really visualize these pieces, because again, we don't want to always wait for Hollywood to highlight and bring things to light, and so I wanted to see, can we do that with AI? And so I basically used the model to find the main themes in that book. Once I found the main themes of the book, I wanted to know where in the book do those themes align. And from there, I used my artistic judgment to really identify these are the main key points from the story that I'm going to create a collection from. After I made those collections, I passed it through the generative model to create the animation shorts that shows the evolution of the story. And one of the piece that, um, one of the piece that got into a really cool exhibition that I'll share at the end of this, really highlights um, her first time when she saw the university. And in the, in the story, it described it as a land that was the shades of the rainbow. And so you can only imagine like what came out was pretty dope. And so that piece and another piece was accepted to Art Basel in 2021. Wow, that's amazing. Round of applause. It's just amazing to see how you can use AI to actually take your ideas and make them into reality, into a story. So that's fascinating to see. And Paul, I know you've done a lot of awesome things. Tell us about them. Yeah. Um, no, I love the multi kind of process layer for, for both of those projects. And for me, that's, I think, the, the best way to use AI is, is, to not, is, is that it is a process, that it's not just one tool, you're done, move on to the next thing. Is that how do these things talk to each other so you can really create something that couldn't have existed before. Uh, so yeah, I guess a little bit more background on from where I'm coming from is 
is, yeah, I, you know, I, I'm a director. I've done a lot of practical effects that, you know, everything's in camera. There's no digital effects to things that are fully animated. So I'm really kind of agnostic to uh, technique. I'm kind of just curious and open to all techniques um, and like to get out of my comfort zone. Uh, I've been keeping tabs on AI going back to like Google's AI uh, as it relates to video, going back to like Google's deep dreaming um, stuff from, I mean, that's like, I don't know, eight years old now yeah, or well, I don't, well, 2016, I feel like, wow. yeah. Uh, which I thought was cool and like would make a great like fear and loathing in Las Vegas like sequence, but uh, kind of like felt limited to like psychedelic imagery and uh, aesthetically limited as well, where I didn't feel like I could quite put my fingerprints on AI generative work uh, until last year. Uh, but I had been keeping tabs on it, like kind of dabbling in private, uh, not sharing anything. Uh, again, because I didn't feel like what I had to offer was, was different enough. Um, so it was really until like the, the sort of uh, light bulb moment for me was uh, seeing Dolly's video where they're demoing in painting. So they, they show like, you know, uh, a panda on the moon and all this stuff. And then at the very end of their video, they showed in painting, which allows you to erase part of an image and replace it with something that matches the lighting, the shadows, the camera angle, uh, the lensing, the aesthetic of the image. It, it matches it and you can replace an object. So I think they have like a monkey uh, who's like, they put like different hats on the monkey and the, and the lighting looked really amazing. So as like a as a director who does a lot of things with visual effects, I was like, like there it is. That's like the next thing in visual effects is like because that shit would take a long time to like three D model everything. You you sit over the shoulder of like a, a concept artist, like being like, no, I want more, I want more. You know, it's like it just uh, the world doesn't work like that. You're kind of given three options and you have to choose from them. So the ability to like have infinite options uh, was super appealing. Um, and daunting, so um, some of my first work was kind of about uh, multiplicity, about uh, endless options and loops and stuff. Uh, so, I, I mean, the first video, I, I, it's hard to say if I'm like proud is relative because it like changes every week. Um, <laughs> like the things that I was proud about, I'm not proud about anymore. Things I'm proud about haven't been made yet, and then by the time they're made, I'm not proud of them anymore. But uh, the, th the first thing that like kind of went big and the first thing that like was real my like like I felt I could put my fingerprint on AI as a, as a video I recreated a shot from a short film I made 10 years ago with a hand and a bunch of objects changing within the hand and it's like the hand opens and closes and it was the first time Dolly had been used with live action video but for me it was like totally intuitive um, and I was like yeah of course this is what you would use it for but it was used kind of in a stop motion sort of way and it's kind of surprised even the people at OpenAI who make Dolly that they didn't even, they're like, oh, we didn't even know you could do, like, do video with it. I was like, maybe you should have talked to filmmakers earlier on. Uh, so and that, that was really encouraging, though, the sort of feedback uh, I got from the internet. A lot of the work I do is like very kind of like, it's, it's technique based, so like it responds well on the internet. And so I, uh, I get a lot of feedback from social media of like, okay, well, that people seem to like that. What else can you do with AI? So since like uh, late May, June, pretty much every week I'd been like showing another use case for AI in the visual effects um, arena uh, and, and now animation as well. I did the GoFundMe piece uh, commercial, the first commercial to use like image to image stable diffusion wow. um, for like two, two minutes, two minute long animation we made in like six weeks, which, you know, for every frame looking the way it does would have been actually impossible six months ago. So uh, again, that's like what I'm looking in AI is to uh, allow us to do things that, not to like replace how we did things, but, but how to do things in a way that we couldn't have done before. I love how you pointed out that a lot of people don't know about in painting. A lot of people think just generative AI is just putting a prompt and putting a completion, but you actually used it to modify something yeah, we all have images, so being able to modify those images is awesome. Don, tell us about your first project. Uh, yeah, so um, there was this app that came out on uh, iPhones uh, called Wombo Dream, and you could like give it an image and then give a very small description, and it would kind of like make a slightly blurrier version of that image. That was like their first version of it. 
And so like the first project that I was, yeah, it was a GAN. So they have like a, a general adversarial neural network approach and they make these really beautiful images um, and it kind of builds on top of your image. And so I had this idea of uh, if I did a, a 3D scan of my head, so I got like a LiDAR scanner with an iPhone, scanned my head, and then brought in every frame of that as an input for the Wombo Dream, and I gave it a new prompt for each like angle. And then I stitched all those videos together, all those frames, and it made like this rotating head that I hadn't painted myself, but like everything was generated on each frame. And I put it on like the, the blockchain and you know minted it as an NFT. And then the result was like, I was like, oh wow, you can like you can you can make a custom piece of artwork that would have taken me very, very long to do. And it was it all looked like it was hand painted on every frame. It had this hand painted look, and uh, I, I was just like stunned. And then just to add more customization into it, I would illustrate on top of the final frame. Because I didn't sometimes there was parts of the AI generated image that I felt didn't feel right. And I was like, oh, well, I'll just, let me just illustrate on top of that part. Like, that'll be, I'll try to fix those mistakes so that it feels more authentic to me. Uh, and then put it out there. And um, yeah, that was kind of like the first project. And then since then, it's just been like, uh, kind of what, you know, what Paul was saying, just nonstop every day, um, coming up with concepts. I've been using a lot of like my VFX background to make VFX ideas of what I think is going to come from AI in the future. And I try to put them out like a year, three years out that I think would be like practical. And then I'll make like a visual, you know, like a short little film, like a minute long piece, put it on Twitter and TikTok and Instagram, and then get people's reactions. And then, you know, have conversations. Some people hate this stuff, some people love this stuff, and there's a lot of in between. And uh, yeah, it's just like that's kind of been the journey from first project to now. I love the theme that you guys are all resonating because a lot of people think AI is going to replace humans, but really, this empowered you guys. This actually made it a lot faster, a lot easier for you to take your ideas, either modify something existing or create something from scratch. So that's amazing to hear. And that also preludes to my next question, which is there's been a tremendous backlash that started, you know, this criticism about AI. There was a lawsuit filed this week from Getty Images towards the creator of Midjourney. And it's going to be interesting how intellectual property, copyright kind of plays into this. But what do you think is going to the, be the impact of all this intellectual property? What do you think is going to be the impact towards AI? I don't want to be the first one to answer this, but I'll try. Obviously, provenance, uh, which is the ability to know, you know wh where the source material is coming from, is an incredibly important part of this conversation um, in no different a way that it is in typical musical composition uh, lawsuits, right? I mean, these things are, these are not new ideas that, that within the entertainment industry, we have rules and regulations around provenance and how we discover provenance. Um, in some ways, I think AI technology will actually improve our ability to determine provenance, but we're obviously not there yet because the, you know, we've just unleashed the dragon to the world. <laughs> Um, but uh, on, a, on a separate note, I mean, I think obviously we've seen so much change over the past 15 years in Hollywood. I was, uh, 2006, I uploaded my first YouTube video and, you know, back then that was like, it was a super weird thing to do. Um, <laughs> and there wasn't such a thing as a content creator or an influencer. And, um, you know, if you, if you wanted to be in the entertainment industry, you, you only worked as a writer, or you only worked in lighting, or you only worked as a director, and there was a path, and you had to take that path, and very few multi-hyphenates could go and do that. That's basically, every content creator is now a multi-hyphenate. They do everything. You learn lighting, you learn sound design, you learn music, you learn editing, you learn how to write. And I think that AI tools will actually just continue pushing forward these kind of visionary, multidisciplinary artists who have a singular vision and then can use AI to imp increase efficiency, improve productivity, um, you know, expand the outer bounds of their own imaginations and do so uh, you know, in a way that's, that's not breaking the bank. And that's what I find exciting about it. So does it change jobs? Yeah, it does. And I can't say that I have a magic ball to like see what that will look like. Um, but look at the millions of people making content now that weren't around 12 years ago. 
And like you said, it doesn't break the bank. So that just means more people are now going to be empowered for that. So that's amazing. And Aya, how about you? I'm very passionate about data science ethics and, and really you know, having ownership in terms of what you're doing or being aware of that. And so in terms of like, should there, like, should Getty sue them or should there be some level of like legal regulation around AI art or just in general AI? And my answer is absolutely yes. So that's kind of my answer. And I think at the same time, we shouldn't look at it as AI is replacing us. I think it's very much this co-creative process as everyone has said on this p panel. Um, really looking at it in a way that, you know, how can I think further? How can I stretch my ideas further? And then the other part that's like amazing is just creating things faster. Um, sometimes the hardest thing is just starting and having this co-creative like super smart assistant to help you, to me is not a bad idea. I love how you said creating things faster. You don't have to spend so much time. You don't have to put in, like you said, six months you can do it so quickly. And Paul? Yeah, absolutely. No, I think that's a, a great point, because uh, I found my productivity has gone up a lot, is getting started is the hardest part. Looking at a blank page is the most like daunting part of the writing process, uh, where you're just staring at blankness, and, and even with ChatGPT, to be like, all right, I have some floating ideas. Just give me, like, get me going. Get the juices flowing. And then now I'm, I'm on my own and I can discover what this is. Uh, so yeah, I, I really think, yeah, the, the AI is, is just great in, in terms of like getting people unstuck. Um, I know we're going on a tangent here, but anyways, I, I really, I that's, tangent, that's how right? I felt. Um, is, yeah, and especially with, with writing, I find visual um, image making is not as like, like much of a stumped process as writing is. Writing. Uh, you can have like the broad strokes of something and then when you get into the details, there's so many points, uh, speed bumps along the way. So anyways, uh, should there be backlash or, or is, what, what do I feel about the backlash? What, uh, I mean, I think um, like anything critical is a good thing. Like you, you should, oh, you shouldn't, no, like no one should just be like, oh yeah, AI, like uh, yeah, pour it on me, like more, like you should be like critical of where this stuff is coming from, how to use it. There should be ethics involved um absolutely um i think the the lawsuit's ultimately a good thing because it's going to clarify a lot of the um the rules um i do fear like um whatever judge and jury is involved in that will not really understand technology because uh, it's because i barely do uh so that's going to be a very like uh nuanced thing um but i do think um even even the artists that are, that are having this really visceral response uh, to seeing images being created so easily and how that, that feels like it, it, it's taking power away from them. Uh, I, I do think uh, there's like validity in, in their feelings, absolutely. Um, but uh, there, is, there is misunderstanding on like how, what, what the, the actual process of it. I think the contention in the lawsuit is, is more of the uh, scraping of data than it is like uh, the transformation, because copy, because uh, in in courts, uh, all that stuff would pass. Because is is it transformative? Does it pass Fair the use. like Andy Warhol has been copy like art has like been copying stuff for a long time, um, and it's all about transformation, whether it's uh, visual transformation or conceptual transformation, like taking a toy, a urinal and flipping it upside down, and then it's a uh, sculpture. Um, it's it's transformed conceptually. Uh, so I, I, I think in court, that's not really the, the issue, and that's actually not what they're arguing. It's, it's the scraping of data, and I think we do need to be more conscious, and, and there should be a, a way for artists to, to have a say whether they are being sampled or not. Uh, for dead artists, uh, honestly, I could like care less, uh, because you know hopefully they're reincarnated and living a different life now. Uh, but but for, for living artists, um, I think it, it should be their, their, they should have the, the right to control their work. Uh, and, I, and I say that because uh, I'm seeing video is, is where the target is next. And uh, I think we're in like a chat group and Facebook released their uh, video, AI video model. And same, same thing where people paid attention to like, oh, I can write text and then I get a video. The thing that I responded to was, 
you can actually input a video, alter it. Uh, you can input a video of whatever, just a, a Ferrari driving down a street, and it'll create another video that is very similar but different and transformative enough from a copyright perspective. So you could frame by or shot by shot steal a movie and regenerate it uh, frame by, through specifically what Meta is working on uh, and, 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 and alter it and um, people might not know the source material. There's already a rampant problem in social media of uh, content being stolen and redistributed without crediting the creator. Uh, so this is going to be, uh, for video, it's going to be, it's, it, was, it was more disturbing uh, when I was like, oh, okay, like people could take these videos that I spend time on and then just pass them off as them, themselves. It's one thing to, to see an image, but to see video looks like it takes work. So I think like that's where I was like, okay, I want to like be able to like have some ownership or say in, in what gets sampled. Um, I think the models will get good enough where we like will have evolved past sampling artists. Um, it just, right now, it, it's built on that. Um, so anyways, uh, but yes, I think, I think we should be critical. I think there should be backlash um, because that's how rules get created. That's how ethics get installed. And there's not really going to be a good way to progress forward unless we kind of get through this uh, contentious point today. Yep. So you're saying I can have a video of me finally driving a Ferrari yeah. or like a Bugatti? <laughs> Oh, very good. Testing. Done. Testing. Is this a good volume for the room? All right, closer. So closer. Closer. Is this a good volume for the room? Okay, great. Um, so, yeah. With, I forgot the question. Uh, pretty much it's about kind of the you know, ramifications of AI to the art community and kind yeah. of that backlash. Okay, so the ramifications. So, uh, yes, artists should be pissed, but also artists should be really excited. It's like this weird, happy, sad emoji. It's like both. Um, what I mean by that is, uh, I think the first two weeks that I was using these AI generative tools, I had an existential crisis because I used to think that art and creativity was far out of the domain of, of um, automation. And so I used to lean into that. I was like, oh, creative is the way. It's the future. And then I start playing with these generative tools, and I'm seeing their outputs, and I'm like, this is actually pretty creative. So. I had this, you know, break of like concern and you know freaked out for a little while, and then what happened was I started thinking, okay, what could I do differently? So I started, can I add it to my workflow and help, you know, help it enhance what I'm doing? But more importantly, um, I've always struggled with things like composition. I, I can do the details myself, but the composition was the hard part. And so um, I read this sci-fi book uh, called The Diamond Age by I think Neil Stevenson, and they actually explored in this was like an older book now, but they explored what happens when we would have 3D printers that can essentially make anything that people want from essentially a text prompt. And it was 3D printing, and, and, and they had a whole chapter in there about what happened to the art industry and the aftermath, and it gave me hope. So in that sci-fi book, um, no, it's, not, it's not too big of a spoiler, but what happened was because art and anything could be generated on the fly very easily, it devalued it. So it went to the cost of zero. But what art like, actually stood up was the stuff that was made by humans, the stuff that had human errors, the stuff that was made by hand, the stuff that was painted meticulously with a story. So in their, in their sci-fi book, all the wealthiest people in their world, they didn't collect digital things made from their 3D printers that wasn't anything worth bragging. They instead, they loved their hand-carved table, their hand-sewn rugs, they loved, so like I actually, these shoes, I, I used AI to generate the concept, and then I painted wow. it with uh, Sharpies. Like, <laughs> and, and so like, the concepts for these shoes were, were AI-driven, but then I was like, well, that's, that's not special now. But now these shoes can become special because they're, they're one of a kind. I painted it myself. And like, I might have struggled with the composition of the shoe. It would have been a difficult problem for me. But then I, I just described it. I said, what if I had uh, Sharpie-style artwork on the side of white converse inspired by color palettes from 90s cartoons. That was the prompt. And I generated hundreds of images until I saw something that I thought was like, oh, that, I would love to wear those. And I'm like, okay, let me go get some Sharpies from the store. Got some little Sharpies, started illustrating. And then now I'm like, wow, I, I have shoes that I, that I want to wear. So I'm thinking this kind of approach might you know, be how I 
I would hope artists can adopt the tools and be like, oh, this sucks right now, but what if I use it to like adapt my workflow a tiny bit and maybe have some, like, you'll, you'll have some cool shoes. Test one, two, that's why we got back up here. Okay, well, I love what you were saying here because you used a very important word, which was devalue, okay? And a lot of people are worried about this. You know, art is, is so amazing because of the time also that it takes an artist to create that, that composition. I've grown up with art. My wife, I fell in love in part with my wife because she was an artist, her and her mom, and I appreciated the amount of time and that thought. So for my next question, in terms of the relationship between AI and real artists, do you think AI is devaluing art? Do you think we're going to be all about just like how we are about our organic food and our non-organic food? Do you think that's going to happen with AI? I love this question so much and I feel so underqualified to answer. Like, I don't even understand how art is valued now. I mean, anyone who's watched an art documentary of the art world, it's like one of the most ludicrous <laughs> industries in terms of how they come up with these values. You know, ultimately, like, we decide if something is valuable and then market dynamics just take their course and they happen. Um, so I don't, I don't know. I, you know, there, 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 it certainly will be less scarce, which would then make me inclined to say that yes, there will be a devaluing, certainly at the top or middle tier level. But I don't know if that's actually true. Um, I do think that there will be some interesting synergies with our uh, wearable sensors like the bio trackers that whether you have an Apple watch or I have the aura ring right now that I'm wearing that tracks my sleep, like looking at how personalized data will inform art and experiences in a way that create a kind of, um, you know, feedback loop for our mood, for focus, for productivity, um, looking at art m less as like a, a maybe just a, va a, a dollar value and more about, well, what can, what kind of mood can it, create for me today? Will it help me sleep better tonight? I wonder if we'll just kind of shift the metrics of value around art. Um, so that's an interesting sort of question that I have personally. So I think I'm a little biased because I don't think that it's going to devalue it because I have been in the art world. <laughs> and so I would say in the art world, um, there is people are understanding more when AI is made in the way that's like very, very, like AI art's made very meticulous. Um, and I think that's where I would consider like the difference between like digital art and digital fine art. Um, and I think that there's a lot of opportunity for um, like both artists, both AI digital artists and like, you know, non-digital artists to work together to create work. Um, I'm even collaborating in my next project with a 3D artist. And so even though she's creating like environments that are not AI generated, we're working together to create, make it interactive. And so I'm creating the like AI co-create, AI co-creative interactive ability to bring her experiences to life in the real world. So now we have mixed reality where um, if you've been to like our tech house or the Van Gogh experience, yeah. where the Van Gogh experience is, is like it's just that you're just immersed. It's not. It's not interacting with you, and that's where I want to take it next with artists and just and people in general. So it's more of a, again, I'm just gonna keep saying co-creative because whether that's I'm co-creating with AI to create the work or now in immersive experiences, you go through the experience and you co-create with AI through the experience. Right. Um, yeah. I guess just a piggyback off of that. Um, I don't. I think it's good. They're, they're like different markets I think we're talking about. Um, if you are in the art world and your, your wife is, my, wife, my wife's uh, an artist as well. She was at Basel this year. And she is actually more in that, the fine arts world um, than I am, obviously. And uh, so I get a glimpse into that world, though, and, and, and the people buying that stuff. Uh, I can tell those people don't give a shit about AI art, uh, to be honest. Like, that's because, um, well, art is, the way art is valued is kind of weird. It's like a slight, like, uh, giant scam uh, where, like, rich people store their money. 
uh, but that's a bigger issue. Um, but that's 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 uh, why certain artists have a lot of values because uh, a, it's a giant like sort of um, insider trading Ponzi scheme, and a bunch of people like decided, yeah, that has value. I'm going to stash my money in there while there's a recession. Uh, and uh, so like it, it, won't, it won't go like down. Art, the thing, art, art, art doesn't actually go down in, in price unless the artist, like, I don't know, becomes a serial killer or something. They're, it either stays the same or it always goes up. Uh, so that's that's uh, so art and value uh, have totally different world uh, rules uh, than like the world of um, digital art. And uh, a lot of that also comes from scarcity. It comes from an, an artist can only output so much work within a lifetime. Uh, like Amy Sherald, I think she has like a, she has a medical condition and she can, she's like counted, she can only paint like, uh, I don't know, like 80 more paintings in her lifetime or something like that. And they're all, they've already all been bought, but they haven't been, they're decades from being created. Uh, so there's a lot of, uh, so it's, she, she did the Michelle Obama um, official portrait. Uh, sh so she's like created a bunch of value from scarcity. All artists, like the, everyone knows that there's scarcity from uh, a, a limited lifetime of, of creating work. So the value for, for AI, like for infinite artwork, the, the rules are totally different. And uh, I don't think people should be thinking of selling AI art in the same way. And uh, the way I'm approaching it is, is more of like, um, well, I, maybe it can be used in a conceptual way. So if you're a conceptual artist, and, and again, like Duchamp turned the toilet upside down, uh, you know, you're using AI art to talk about AI, and, and there's a conceptual aspect, and you create a, a scarce thing. Uh, yeah, but like the, the sort of like infinite generation machine, uh, I don't think that has value, and, and that's not why we should be placing it uh, value on it it's, it's again it's 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 great for like artists or, or people that weren't even creative before to allow themselves to be creative and I think there's value in that so we don't have to put m money like a number on that if it gets someone that's like if it gets someone you know that that had you know lived their whole life wishing they could draw and then the, and they couldn't draw and now they can like at least dream a little bit like more vividly. I think there there's value in that. Um, so yeah, so I think we need to differentiate. Like when we say AI art, it's not like the blue. We're not talking about blue chip art. We're talking we're not t we're talking about two different worlds. Um, so anyway, yeah. So I love what you said there in the beginning. You said it's almost going to create another market. So this is almost another industry that's going to be the AI art, and then you have like well, let's call it your handcrafted art. Sounds really funny saying it now, but yeah, that's the reality. Yeah, Very and I mean, and a, and a market in that, like, it, it it may not even be in an exchange of money. It could just be like, uh, a, like more of a community or something, or a, like Pokemon or, or, cards. I'll trade you yeah. my AR for your AR. Yeah, maybe. I I think it's more like it, the way we should be looking at AI art is not. It's not like the end product. It's like, like you were saying, it's the beginning of the process. It's not the end process. Um, and maybe then it's the, the back and forth conversation between the artists and the machine that then creates something that, that someone else can have created, right? So, like, I actually came from drawing and painting. That's what I went, originally went to school for before I changed to video. And I could go and I could try to, like, draw something and try to copy it exactly. And no matter if I try to copy it exactly or not, it's always going to, like, be filtered through my hand. Um, and I can I I could never just do something exact. So uh, I think the the beauty in art making is the, is the process of like thinking you're starting with one idea and then like what it transforms into by the end. So um, I think AI is just like again just it's 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 just part of that. But it, it it's the process and it's like the, the filtration through the the person's hand that makes it uniquely theirs and uh, not something that anyone could create. I love that. And Don, you, do you think it's going to devalue? you think we're going to have another industry? What do you think? Yeah, so I'm like a dualist on this one. So I think it's unfortunately going to immediately devalue all digital art, which is so weird because I'm like a very optimistic, positive person. That's so like out of character for me. But I'm being honest because like if, if, if you're, if, you know, I, I, like I'm thinking at, at DreamWorks, when we would make movies, 
if we could make more movies and more shows more than like more often, more frequently than our competitors, we might be able to sell. We could probably sell more things. So it's like if you're the studio that's like, well, we're going to refuse to use AI because it's not, it doesn't have the same soul as art that's done by hand, which is now like digital, I guess. So then those folks are going to maybe struggle to sell as much product. But like I think the value of art for just hobby will can will go up. Like it's it's weird because the the word value is is throwing me off because I'm like wondering like, value in in what metric? Like just an economic metric? Yeah, spiritual in, in metric. terms of definitely the monetary. You know, a lot of obviously artists, you know, are trying to make revenue. That's why NFTs has really blown up because it's allowed them to monetize and control that. So now with the introduction of AI, just a couple of years later. You know, what do you think that's going to impact? You think it's going to hurt them? I think it's weird. It's going to do both. It's going to hurt a lot of people, and then it's also going to benefit a lot of people. It's it's really both, which is like a you know a crappy answer, and I'm sorry, but no, very good, but very I, good answer. I, no but to add to that, I think it's going to make the value of handmade stuff go up through the roof. I think fine art's going to have like a golden age again, because it's going to be like this truly unique thing. And like no one can even question whether or not the AI made it because it was like, they you know I think for digital artists if you're hearing this now, like if you can document your process very thoroughly, yep. so that people can like a time lapse of your con yeah, how long it took you to conceive the idea, how often were you like building drafts, how like were you having conversations about this? I feel like that is going to be like the provenance. That's going to be what makes the digital art valuable. Because like, I think recently someone just got in trouble. Uh, they got kicked off of a popular Reddit art group because their artwork looked too much like AI art. And the artist was devastated because it was not. Uh, according to her, it was her own art style. And the person who was running the very large community of artists says, no, I can clearly tell it's AI driven and you can't, you're not welcome in this group. And they removed her. And that she sucks. and I was thinking, man, I wish she had some provenance. I wish she showed like her process of how she made her artwork, so she could have evidence to contest that she did in fact make the piece. But it just blew my mind because I think that's going to keep happening soon to video, to animation, to 3D modeling. It's not just 2D images. It's coming for all kinds of entertainment. I think that's really interesting what you point out at the end that she got kicked out because it's. There's companies now that are running an AI to detect other AIs. And I think, wow, in a couple of years from now, you're going to have like an AI war where AIs are just going to be detecting each other. Like humans are not going to be able to tell if this is written by AI. They're going to have to use another AI to then find out if that was made by an AI. It's happening right now. I have like a bot that I use for my Instagram to do some educational content. And sometimes, like once a week, it gets into a bot fight with another person's bot, and it's hilarious. I watch their conversation unfold. No human That's was awesome. involved there, and I'm looking and I'm like, "Wow, this is hilarious!" Like I almost could, like I don't know, I don't know what the hell that is. Well, this segment's great into my next question. So, singularity is defined at the point that AI reaches or surpasses human intelligence. So, if you had to make a guess. A guesstimate, estimate as to when that will be. When do you think that will be? It depends on how you define that. I mean, Chat GPT is already way smarter than I am. Uh -huh. That's true. Um, That's true. And it depends on how you define intelligence. All, all I'll say on this is that we have reached an inflection point that is um, the most exciting and terrifying of my lifetime. You know, I think like it's, it, we get to see all these technologies as they unfold from the iPhone becoming really the first, you know, digital camera, all, you know, all apps in your hand um, to, to VR. I work in neurotechnology, so I get to see some pretty mind blowing stuff every day. Um, I think what's happening with artificial intelligence will change absolutely everything about the way that we work, the way that we live, the way that we interact with each other, and uh, it's going to happen very fast. So you think singularity has already arrived? Call it whatever you want to call it. We're on a, we're on a rocket there. ship. There you go. Aya, what's your thoughts? Um, I have to agree. You know, ChatGPT is smarter than me. Um, it passed, like, the Wharton exam, the LSAT. You know, it's pretty intelligent. 
Um, but I, I would also agree that um, ultimately it's really interesting to see how we can work with AI and not really be afraid of it, but really seeing you know, where can we improve our productivity, where can it you know, increase our insights, where can we really explore it. Um, I think back to just even, for me, like now that most people understand AI, I'm more excited because I feel like now people know what I do every day. And so it's really exciting just to see the new opportunities that are going to come from it. Absolutely. And Paul, you? Uh, I guess I'm just going to stick with what Ray Kurzweil is predicting because he's been pretty like solid with his predictions. I think it's 2036, he says. I don't know. Um, 13 has, years. Yeah. I mean, because we're, I mean, it's one thing to talk about like intelligence, but I think we're also talking about there's, there's like so many kinds of, yeah, we're talking about sentience uh, and, and, and agency. Uh, because right now, ChatGPT has zero agency. Uh, it, it, it's actually like pretty passive. Um, it just does whatever you want it to do, and as as all the AIs do, they're uh, to serve mankind for now. Um, so sentience, for now. right, is is when it starts to make decisions beyond uh, what it was programmed to do. When it starts to write its own code, um, or machine learning. Uh, I, I think I, I think the uh, singularity actually. The way he was predicting, Ray Kurzweil was predicting it, was when supposedly quantum computing is going to actually be accessible. Because uh, as much as people think it, like they found it, like quantum computing is still really far off. Uh, so I think that's it's because that's essentially like uh, as fast as our brain is processing. So it's one thing to be a really good like um, sort of Wikipedia that has like an interface that's uh, a friendly like friend, uh, but but to have uh, sentience where you know um, it starts to like, you you ask it to uh, make paperclip it's a paperclip like conundrum or whatever where you ask uh, the machine to make you paperclips uh, make just keep making me paperclips because we have to keep uh, exporting paperclips to Office Depot. Uh, so the machine takes over, has sentience, and is like, all right, well, I'm going to make uh, fucking paper clips until like, like the fucking world is over. And so I'm going to destroy all these chairs in the room, melt them down, keep making paper clips. Oh, there's humans getting in the way of me making paper clips. Uh, I have to get rid of those humans so I can keep making that. To, so that's, um, that's like true sentience where it's like it's, it's, it's overriding any sort of programming and it's, uh, it's just making decisions on its own. I think that's actually pretty far away. And uh, I think also, like, there's a lot of stuff that we take for granted that we do really easily uh, that machines still struggle with. Even driving uh, is not, it's not really quite there yet. Um, even, like, you know, the way we're responding, passing these microphones back and forth, I think a computer would still have difficulty, like, trying to respond to the dexterity of that and be seamless. There's, those are things that are just background that, that our brain processes, uh, that's still really difficult for machines. But then there's things that, that feel like it's, uh, it's reached singularity, like chat GPT, where it's like, oh my god, I wouldn't have been able to write that, and it did it within seconds. So it, it, uh, there's things that are really hard for humans to do uh, that, that are not um, difficult for machines to do. Uh, and so there's still like um, this sort of yin and yang uh, going on where um, we take her for granted a lot of stuff, so then we're really impressed when the AI does something, and then uh, the AI does something that's like really difficult that it it, it, it doesn't even think twice about. Um, so it, it can appear at first glance, and that's why that like uh, what's his name it, that left Google like was kind of raising the alarms. And I I think we're very like it, it feels close, but um, it's it's always, and it's the same as like in the visual effects world as in maybe a lot of things, it's like the last 10% is always like the hardest. Like a visual effects shot, it's like, you can get 90% of the way there, uh, and it, like you understand what the shot is supposed to do, but it's the last 10% that's like believable. Uh, so I, I think, it, yeah, there, there's gonna be that, that kind of threshold for a minute here, but anyways, yeah, it's still- So we still have time. Yeah, Very good. Uh, I guess. <laughs> time is relative. So singularity. I think we'll look back at this moment and we were like thinking it was going to be a year and it turns out it was a gradient. So like we slowly have been transitioning into the singularity since about the time that we got computers that scaled in everybody's pockets. So like there's already like all these systems that we have. It's, it's, it's weird because we were tr 
de you know, defining the word singularity based off of our knowledge of technology at that time. I don't know when that term first came out, but I think it's at least 40 or 50 years old now. So it's like, I mean, in many regards, we have already passed it. Uh, in some ways, we haven't even scratched the surface yet. So I think it's more of like a gradient. But um, similar to you, I'm thinking like Ray, Ray Kurzweil's timeline seems pretty, pretty spot on. Um, so for all the fear that that, that causes, uh, community, empathy, human interaction are all things that it struggles to do really, really, really well. So if you can like prioritize a lot of like human things right now over everything else, then the AI revolution won't like ruin all of humanity, just the parts where we didn't have it already. Beautifully said. So final question, are you guys ready? If you had to give a very simple advice to everybody in this audience about AI art, what would that be? Just experiment with it. Like, especially if you're trying to form opinions about, about you know, what it should be doing in the world and how you want to be implementing it in your own life. I mean, just experiment. There's so many different tools. So many, that's all, that's simple. Experiment, love it. I would suggest uh, exploring artists who are using it very creatively. So Vellum LA, uh, for those in LA, is a gallery that shows digital art from artists who are fine tuning their own models or creating their own models and are you know, similar to my process of creating the work, really take their time to think through why they create it and they're using different models. So I think just even just the education to understand like, the difference between someone who's just using an app to someone like this is their like work, like this is their, their PhD. Um, so that's like one of my advice. And the second one I would say is, yeah, just like jump in and, and maybe like, what do you really like? Do you really like music? Do you like whatever you specifically like? Like I would just explore that. There is definitely an AI tool for that. Um, so Google's your best friend. I love it. Vellum LA, it's on Melrose Ave in um, West Hollywood. Check that out, ladies and gentlemen. And Paul, you. Hey, like how I use it and, and how I encourage other people to use it is, is that, again, it shouldn't stop. Like the, the end product shouldn't be what the AI gives you. You should keep the, the sort of ping pong back and forth between it. So use multiple tools together. Um, see what, what, if you can take you know, a piece of what the AI gives you, but can you, can you go and, and shoot something on your own or, or make something on your own that the AI is working with? Uh, and, and so, and also, if you're going to use AI, think about just the why. Um, you know, this is very basic, but like, uh, are, are you creating work that um, couldn't have been created before? Are you creating uh, conceptual work that um, needs AI because it's, it's conceptually tied in? Whatever it might be, but just, I, I think um, it's always healthy to like ask yourself why you're doing something, um, but not to discourage you from just going out and trying shit. Um, but yeah, I think, I think always like con constantly like, like, uh, check yourself in the process and, uh, ask yourself, am I, you know, okay, now I can create any image I want, but now am I like creating imagery that's like contributing anything to a larger discussion? Am I pushing these tools beyond like what they were originally designed for? So check yourself before you wreck yourself. Keep checking it. Don, go. Yeah, um, a lot more people are going to need a lot more hope for the future. So like if my advice, if you're going to start getting into AI art is try your best to try to get some narratives out there that give people hope for tomorrow versus just like despair. Because if all of us are just like sad about our future, we're going to have a sad future. It's just that's how it works. So if you're going to start using AI art, please start making artwork of like what the world you would really, really want it to look like. Um, but it is good to be critical. So if you want to have some dark stuff in there too, I understand. But like, if that's all we see, which we have plenty of right now, that would be a really shitty future. So um, my, my ask is if you're using any of these AI art tools, um, please share some, some light, some joy, some positivity. And if you need a, a metric for that, I follow this concept called Ikigai. It's, this, uh, it's spelled I-K-I-G-A-I. And please Google it. It's, a, it's, it's when four circles uh, intersect all together. The ikigai is the middle. Uh, the first circle is what you love. So find out what you love. Next circle is what you're good at. The next circle is what the world needs. 
And the last circle is what, can you, what you can be paid for. And the ikigai is that thing in the middle. And so I would ask for people that are interested in AI art that makes people happy in the future, if you use AI artwork to get you closer towards that center point, I think it makes a way less shitty future for like most people. So um, yeah, that would be my advice. Absolutely, I could not agree more. Thank you guys. Thank Round you. of applause for our panelists. Thank you guys. I wanted to leave some time for some questions. I'm sure you guys all have questions. How do you think that AI technology could affect graphics um, and like motion graphics and print graphics, digital graphics in general? And can you compare it to how desktop publishing changed things in the 90s? I'll, I'll take this one. So I used to be a motion graphics designer. That was like my job. I, I think I change my job title probably every three months now. That's like a, a norm. So um, the question was, how will AI affect motion graphics and graphic design? So in the short term, uh, that's what's coming next. So like we're seeing all these images being generated that you see here. Um, you might have noticed in some of the artworks that are here, some of them are actually motion graphics. They're moving. So for the motion graphics industry, if you start using AI artwork to generate your keyframes, there's new AI models coming out that can do this process called interpolation, where it will blend between frame one and frame two and draw all the in-betweens. So that technology, one that I think is pretty affordable that you could experiment with right now in a browser is called Runway ML. It's a video editing software. It runs in a web browser, so you don't need to have it downloaded. But you can actually have a bunch of sequence of AI-generated images, and it can interpolate the in-betweens. Now, if you're really good at animating, you can come up with you know, all your key poses, and then you'll get animation out. So in the short term, it's not there yet. The quality's not like, very sharp. But it's just going to be like, I mean, honestly, like a year, maybe less, where we're like, oh, wow, that's like really good motion graphics work. Um, what was the one by Google that they did? It was, was it image Google Gen? What was it? Imagine. It's spelled I-M-G-E-N. It's a Google research paper. They showed some very impressive, very impressive motion graphics that Google's AI is capable of. It's currently not public, but their paper shows a lot about how it works, and I would highly encourage you to take a look at it. I'll just add, uh, the piece I did out there, the GoFundMe ad, uh, is uh, the most of it's created in, in After Effects, actually. But the, I'll talk about the process. And, and I mean, it was, it was kind of a motion graphics project, essentially. Uh, where we we used it to we used uh, stable diffusion and Dolly to kind of storyboard concept art all the uh, there's seven vignettes in there of uh, animated vignettes we um, we kind of concepted like different compositions then we went and we shot actors in a um, on a sound stage uh, performing and, and sort of matching what some of the storyboard frames were so we got real live performance out of people. And then we, uh, we actually used Runway to rotoscope uh, the people, uh, drop the frame rate down to like an animation frame rate, right? Like uh, eight or 12 frames per second. Uh, so it, it has the like um, half, the, the, like every two frame animation. And, um, but we were still animating the cameras, uh, you know, in After Effects. We were using humans to, to drive the performances. Uh, but the humans were reinterpreted to look like paintings every frame. Then once we had, like, we had a 3D world that we kind of made from the AI uh, scenery, we kind of broke it out into 3D objects, flew the camera through in 3D, then exported it as frames again, and then ran it through Stable Diffusion one last time. So it, it has this, like, every, like, kind of like what you did, basically, with your, your saying early on with the rotation thing. Uh, and, and it gave us like an aesthetic that we just couldn't have ha had access to before, but there was still a lot of control uh, that we, we had where it was, um, it was very much directed. I directed it. It was like, we, we need the camera to go there. It needs to hold here for this amount of time. Then it pans up, then it pushes through a window or whatever. Um, so it was a way we used AI uh, for, for asset generation, which it's already there, can be used, and, and for stylistic applications uh, that just, Weren't, weren't an option before. 
Uh, in terms of like motion graphics and coding, I think it, it actually may be there with ChatGPT if you try, because you can already use uh, scripting with motion graphics. If you need to animate a bouncing ball, right, that a, has a certain physics to it. Uh, and, I, and I believe ChatGPT actually, you could write, you could say, write a script in this coding language that animates a ball, like a red ball dropping, and it'll like give you that. So uh, that's a very like, it's still like primitive, but um, that's a glimpse at, at the future is you will be able to type text, get uh, a script back, and then you, if you know enough motion graphics, you can use scripting to drive animation. Uh, so that's another way of, of thinking about it. Yeah. My programmers are literally doing HTML from ChatGBT to make things bounce. And it works great. It's amazing. So right now I'm in a two, I'm in the second week of a four week training for NVIDIA Omniverse. And so I would say that is also like the future of AI. And uh, my background, as I said, is the data science, like generative art, and I'm just getting into 3D modeling and working in a 3D world. And so honestly, like I'm waking up every day excited just for being in the experience. And in my cohort, we've been able to kind of like Google Docs where everyone can be on a, you know, the same document to work on it. With NVIDIA Omniverse, you can do that and you can create a scene together. And so we basically create a park and there's like 14 of us, you know, around, this, around the United States, but able to create it in real time. So NVIDIA Omniverse, it can connect to Blender, connect to Unreal Engine, connect to Maya. With Maya and Unreal Engine, it can um, generate render in real time, so like literally instantly. Like, and it, it can also render like, like real time and like photorealistic imagery. So that just adds another layer of in like digital twins. So when you create simulated environments, you can now train AI or a virtual robot in a virtual environment. So there's just so many applications to that as well besides like motion graphics. So, you know, pretty excited. <laughs> All right, our final question on this side, first hand up. Hi. Um, before I ask my question, uh, I'm really excited about AI, and I think it's going to change the world for the better in, in many ways. However, what's your opinion on some level of regulations, some level of control of what you can and cannot do with AI? Because I'll, and I'll share one example, Cl clear view. AI that collects images and can identify my face in 900 different ways. They harvested images from LinkedIn, from Facebook, from Instagram, unauthorized. So that's one example for like uh, too loose of a regulation for an industry, where it can lead. I will give you another one, and I'm sorry it's from another industry, but it's the supplement industry. Since 1972, they lobbied against being regulated by the FDA and today, in 2022, one out of three bottles at CVS and Walgreens don't even contain what's on the label. So imagine this is something that it doesn't go through the FDA approval. They just, people unfortunately abuse it. Uh, I don't mean to be cynical here, but yeah. Too <laughs> unregulated, I guess, leads into a lot of problems. So what's your view? Who should regulate this? How could you control like people from abusing that system? Uh, I guess I can go first. Uh, I mean, I don't think we get to decide who re regulates uh, anything. I think that's already decided for us uh, in America. Uh, the government regulates everything um, with money, right? So it's money and the government that, that regulate things. So, uh, you know, tech big tech or Wall Street, uh, they'll create regulations through their money. Um, so we, but as, as the public, we don't really get, have a say, um, which is unfortunate, but uh, the, the sad reality. And so it's, it's, it's kind of on the onus of um, people like OpenAI, Stable Diffusion, um, some of the bigger players to start implementing these regulations uh, before the government does, but it will happen, there will be a point where the government, because they're so slow with everything, maybe in five years they'll finally catch up and realize AI is a problem, um, which they should be doing it, you know, they should have been doing it the last election. Um, but I, I just worry uh, when it gets to the government, they're not, there's not gonna be a level of understanding 
and, and, and things could get regulated wrong. Um, and of course, if it has to do with like finding a face in a crowd, uh, that will never get regulated. Uh, but um, there's gonna be a huge misunderstanding on, on generative work uh, you know, by the time it reaches the government level. So I, I think it really is on, on open AI and stable diffusion to start implementing ethics. That they're already letting artists opt out. Um, opting in to being in a model is not really an option because they're scraping like uh, petabytes of data. Uh, you couldn't like ask every single artist or photographer to like whether that you could use their image. But I think letting people opt out is a good like first step into uh, creating some sort of regulations. Um, it gets tricky when you're talking about like, all right, can you regulate what people then make from it, whether the, whatever we are, sample this artist or not, uh, what what you can make with it? Because um, I don't know, I, I I fantasize in a dark way. Maybe I'm like the opposite of Don, but of like the um, the sort of Doctor Strange Love future where like. World War III happens because of a miscommunication that was like created from AI, um, and uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't think there really is going to be a way to regulate that as long as stable diffusion is is releasing everything open source. So there's there's good things and bad things. I think the good outweighs the bad in terms of like should everything be regulated. Um, but open AI has been trying to like. Um, they're like kind of the opposite, uh, even though their name is OpenAI. They actually do have a lot of safety, like kind of sensors. Uh, and I find it, especially with ChatGPT, it's kind of limiting. It's like too positive all the time. Um, and so I feel like there, there needs to be some sort of balance. And in a, in a perfect world, if we could dream it, it would be some sort of like, uh, like uber democratic world where there's like a, a, a blockchain government of like people like voting on what the regulations are because this is a global problem and not a country problem. Um, but that's just a, a fantasy, so anyways. I agree with the fantasy. And I would love for that to happen, but same, same thing. I don't think, unfortunately, I don't really think we get too much of a say in the regulation because unless you have the most money in the world and the most government and the biggest military. I think those folks are gonna be the ones that create a lot of the regulations on, on AI and a, and a lot of the laws that we, we follow. But in, in my dream, it would be so nice if like everyone in the world can like essentially vote on what the regulation and what the, what the official laws are. And then maybe individual countries and cities could have siloed off versions of AGI that can be catered to their communities. So like maybe in that community, the AGI is like, it's voted upon in that community, like kind of like how there's like state, you know, there's federal law and then there's like state law and then there's like, and then, then there's actually how your like community runs. It would be so cool if you had like an AGI equivalent of that where you have like laws that everyone agrees, then laws for like a region and then laws for a smaller region and then maybe like an individualized thing that still follows the laws of the, of the predecessor. But I, have, I don't know how to do that. I've actually been you know, chatting with ChatGPT about it. I've been actually trying to come up with a way that would like be a fair regulation of who gets to govern AI. It has a lot of biases, so I'll keep trying, but um, you know, yeah. We should just ask AI how it wants to be regulated. It'll tell you. <laughs> Ask him and see, see yeah. what. It'll join us. We'll, we'll have them here next time. They, or, or she, whatever AI you like, they'll, they'll be here. Thank you guys so much. Thank you all.